This conference will now be recorded. Well, hello everybody and welcome to the latest instalment of our webinars. Uh, this morning we are joined by Stephen Gomez of uh, Amiga Finance um, and he'll be just covering some funding, lending and mortgage advice um, with a short presentation. Um, your normal presenter, Stephen, is taking a well-earned rest for a couple of weeks, so you're with me. My name's Andrew, Andrew Whiteley. I'm the Senior Accounts Manager here at Harps, and always available if you need a chat uh, through anything. I can certainly get you in contact to the people in the know. Um, it says. So, just before we start, just our usual disclaimer that the following presentation is produced for general guidance only, and professional advice should always be sought before any transaction is undertaken. Individual circumstances can vary and therefore no responsibility can be expected by Hearts or any of their affiliates for any action taken or any decisions made to refrain from actions by attendees of this presentation. The date today is the 20th of April, so if you're catching this up on YouTube, um, please do check in with us uh, for all the latest uh, rates um, and all the latest um, knowledge that we have. So just a few little updates on where we're at. We're into the new financial uh, year. So we're now into the 23-24 tax year. Um, that means the corporation tax increase has now kicked in. Um, we've got a separate um, videos on our YouTube uh, covering some of that. Sadly as well, the additional super deduction for your capital allowances has now come to an end. So hopefully you've managed to get all your purchases in, uh, major capital purchases in before uh, the end of March. Um, you still get your annual investment allowance, so it's not all lost, but um, certainly do have a word with us about that. And, and just the other fact is the um, effective removal of the lifetime allowance for pensions. Um, we know plenty of IFAs, you probably know plenty yourself. Um, please do speak to them. Um, if you've got cash in a business and you're looking to extract, um, that's a really good way of getting good tax relief and putting the money away for a, a very rainy day in the future. Obviously go to our website, it's full details, all the latest news sections in there, and obviously we're only ever a phone call away. So you can contact any of us on LinkedIn. Uh, this uh, presentation is actually being recorded for YouTube, so it'll go on there, and hi to anyone who's catching up on that. Um, we're on the Twitter, able to, to get on that we're also now on spotify as well and and i appreciate some people can't always watch the videos um, on youtube but obviously spotify if you can get it in your car you can listen to these presentations or various interviews with um, some of our team and some of our contacts on there very useful very informative certainly worth getting on to our next webinar is on the 16th of may about cyber resilience um, obviously cyber attacks are, are, are ongoing and always there so it's certainly worth knowing how to protect yourself and on the 22nd of june uh, the free ports um, is all about import and exporting uh, you don't want to miss this webinar uh, we have angus hurt who is the head of customs at sso logistics he's our guest speaker um, they're involved in um, one of the few free ports in this country. So if you are involved in importing and exp exporting, please do get on that webinar. It will be very informative. So I'll hand you over shortly to our um, guest speaker today, Stephen Gomez. As I said, he's the owner of Amiga Finance. He's been in the commercial broking industry in, and he's based in Stockport. And he supports businesses across the UK to access their funding. Steve has been funding in financial services for 24 years and set up Amiga in 2017 after 10 years of working for the UK's largest premium finance company and decided to move into lending to broking. Um, he's also a Liverpool fan and a keen gardener. <laughs> Dad of three boys and two stepkids. So uh, those with children, we know what a busy man he is. So Steve, I'll pass over to yourself. So let's like hope I can get this, uh, so if I can get this to work now, you'll have to let me know uh, as a starting yeah, point. Yeah, I'll let you know as soon the, as we're up and running on it. If we get it on there. Yeah, that's the one. Right, Are we in? You, Steve. Super, thanks, Andrew. And uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as, as Andrew said, Amiga Finance is a commercial finance brokerage. Uh, we're based in Chief Human Stockport, although we support businesses across the UK. Um, 
and and um, thanks, I suppose, to Hearts for putting on this webinar. As Andrew's already mentioned, for the Q and A sessions they do, the roundtables, and the business club. And thanks again to everyone who's joined us now and who's going to watch this on the YouTube channel. Uh, today's webinar, we're going to try and cover off uh, a, a few things. It will be a little bit of a, a whistle stop because the areas that we're going to talk about could be covered off in individual 30 minute sessions because of the depth of, of information that's available. But hopefully this gives you a flavor for um, the world that we're in. So let's have a look. What funding's available? We'll touch on that. Uh, what the, the current finance climate is like, um, where the pounds come from, who it's lent to, why businesses borrow, uh, average loan sizes. That'll give you an idea if what you're asking for for a certain thing is is in the right sort of area. Um, hopefully give you some rationale as to why lenders don't lend money um, and then look at where they perceive future growth sectors to be and, and what the threats to growth may also be. Um, when you're looking for funding, what information you're going to need to collate to get together to be able to, to have the best chance of, of raising that money. Uh, how the process works, kind of timescales and, and, and what goes on once an application is in. And then it would be remiss me if I didn't at the end quickly cover off um, why use a broker, the role we have um, and the, the value that we add. Banks declining accessibility as, as business owners across the country will know. Banks are closing and getting hold of somebody, getting hold of that old fashioned bank manager just isn't something that business owners can easily do. And that's where uh, an accountant and a broker can can be that absolute um, pillar of support when it comes to, to raising capital. So here we go. Uh, what funding is available? Um, well, there's five that we're going to come down on this screen. The first one is asset finance. Um, we'll have a look at the styles, the sectors and the types of assets that might be funded. Um, and with asset finance, it comes in in four general styles. Higher purchase or HP covers 55% of uh, all the asset finance that's done. And if you're looking to own the asset at the end of the, the term of repayments, then HP is, is absolutely the, the style of asset finance that you want. Um, the VAT with this is paid up front. Um, so that can, can be a bit of a drain, but um, at the end of the two, three, five years, maybe even all the way up to eight or 10 years, depending on the asset that's being purchased, you will own the title. There'll be a small option to purchase fee, but you will own that asset. So if the intention is to own it, HP is the route to go, and that's that probably accounts for the big percentage. Uh, if you're not bothered about owning the asset, then there's a few options open to you. Um, finance lease is probably just under one in five of asset of all asset finance done is done by a finance lease, um, and this is is where the the VAT rather than being paid up front because it's a lease is paid on a monthly uh, basis, and that can certainly support cash flow. At the end of a lease, you won't own it you'll have no entitlement to own the asset on a finance lease but you can do one of two things you can extend the term of the lease on what's called a peppercorn rental and that would um, predominantly be the old monthly payments that you're making you would make once a year so if you're paying 200 pound a month during the term of the lease then the peppercorn rental would be 200 pound a year and you can extend it for another year and decide what to do extend it another year and decide what to do and the reason that that's available is because the asset's been paid down. And, and so the lender who's got their money back is happy to just make a few quid to, to lease it back to you. The other option on finance lease is that you can sell it on behalf of the lender. And if you do this, you have to do it at a fair market value. But if you do this, then you will receive the majority of the proceeds of that sale. It could be, could be 100%. It's more likely 90 or 95%. Um, and that can be a way of, of getting some money back into the business. Then there's an operating lease. Um, this is similar to business contract hire, but an operating lease um, is where you're unsure whether you want to own it or not. You, you would like lower monthly repayments, um, certainly lower than a, an HP or a finance lease. And an operating lease has a residual value built in. So if the asset's worth 50,000 and the, the residual value is 20,000, then the repayments will only be based on the £30,000 worth of capital. That, by default, reduces the amount of the repayments. 
Um, on these, with it being a lease, the VAT is paid on a monthly basis. And at the end of this, at the end of an operating lease, um, there are four options. You can simply return it, unlike you can with a finance lease, you can simply return it. You can again extend it. You can agree terms to extend that lease, maybe over six months, 12 months, 24 months, and, and agree repayment terms on that. You could purchase it. There's a residual value that's been agreed at the front end, so you, you know what it would be, what it would cost to purchase. Or again, you can sell it on behalf of the funder. And with an agreement in place beforehand, you will get 50, 80, 90% of the, the sale proceeds. And then business contract hire, um, very similar to operating lease. It's often used for cars and vehicles, um, and it, it works in the same way as an op lease, but there's the service is included in the in the price, the, the tires and such like. So that's asset finance, <coughs> one type. Uh, invoice finance, uh, this, this is where funding is secured against the invoices that the business is raising, and it comes in two styles, uh, discounting and factoring. And these are very similar with the, the main obvious and important difference being that with discounting, the credit control is done by your business. So you have to be a size to be able to do that credit control. You have to be happy chasing your customers for payment and such like. Um, if that isn't your, your cup of tea, or if you, you haven't got the, the manpower, the capabilities to do that credit control, then factoring may be a, a better route to go because in this, the invoices are chased by the lender. Um, as a result, discounting is slightly cheaper. And factoring is slightly more expensive um, because of the, the cost the lender has to incur. Uh, and it, it's had a bad reputation, invoice finance as a whole, or factoring as it's called. Um, but it's it's moved on a lot since 2000, also since 2008, and even in the last three or four years, <clears throat> what we find is that many businesses have invoice finance that's been in place for five, 10, 20 years, hasn't been reviewed, and is, is nowhere near the best option that they could possibly um, achieve. So it's certainly worth looking at, at invoice financing if you've got it in place already just to review it. Um, it's important to remember that with this, there are a few charges. Um, first and foremost, they won't advance necessarily 100% of the invoice. They might only advance 50% or 80% of that invoice. So understanding what percentage of the invoice you'll get on day one is important. And then there's charges. There's a, a service fee or an admin fee. And this is a percentage of the total invoice. So for £10,000 and a 1% admin fee, then there'd be a £100 cost for doing it. And then there's the discount or the factor rate, depending on whether you're discounting or factoring. And this tends to be linked to Bank of England, Bank of England plus one or two or three percent. This is based on the amount that's being factored. So if, for example, there's a £10,000 invoice and it's an 80% that you can access, then the, the factor rate would be the percentage charged on the £8,000 in this scenario. Um, some funders are now making it simpler again because it's it's been... In the past claim that there's been many different um, catches and charges that are hidden away. It's cleaned up in the last 10 years massively. And now there are even some funders out there that will simply do a service fee. So you know the percentage of the invoice that you're factoring or, or discounting, that is the sole charge that's associated to it. And that makes it a lot simpler um, for, for business owners who are too busy or for for business owners who aren't necessarily um, as confident on the math side of things as they would like to be, or haven't indeed got the time to do it. Invoice finance, sorry for going on. Uh, business finance, uh, this kind of comes in, in many different guises, but traditionally there's the following three, term loans or bank loans. Um, these are available over anywhere from three months all the way up to six years. Important to say here that it's almost certain that a personal guarantee or a director's guarantee will be required for these. Um, certainly post-COVID, a lot of business owners have, have got into the um, position of not needing to give a guarantee because of bounce back loans, SIBLs and the recovery loan scheme. But term loans um, will almost always require a guarantee behind them. Um, the, the rates move from 5.5% upwards, although realistically a low 
double digit rate, 10, 11, 12% is now a good rate. And, and I think that expectation of low single digits that have been around for so many years and were there with, with the government back funding, that those days have gone. Um, if you're offered a rate that's anywhere from nine to 12, 13%, they're reasonable rates. Um, there's a revolving credit facility. That's that's ultimately, it's, it's like an overdraft. Um, it's a 12 month renewing facility. It's regularly secured against either property or invoices. So if you've got an invoice finance line in place, you won't be able to get a revolving credit facility. Um, and the way this works is that rather than it being specific invoices that you're factoring, you're able to dip into a cash pot when you need it, like you would with an overdraft, and pay it back when the invoices are paid. So it's not specific to anything. It's it's a bigger, broader um, cross-book facility. Rates on this, um, Bank of England plus 5%, and, and anywhere upwards, depending on the quality of the business making the application, the credit rating of the directors, the experience, it would come down to an underwrite. But again, Bank of England plus 5% upwards isn't too, isn't too bad as an interest charge. And there are fees as well. There's an arrangement fee at the front end and there's a monthly facility fee. So doing the maths and making sure that you've got a full understanding of the costs over a quarter or a year is important. And again, a broker or an accountant can, can support you and assist you with that. And the third type of business finance I'm touching on, just to make you aware of, is, is merchant cash advances for those who use point of sale um, EPOS systems or, or have a till. Um, and this is where you get a cash lump sum linked to till sales, um, up to 120% of, of till sales. Um, it's it's not expensive lending. Um, it's not cheap either. Factor rates start at, at 1.2. So if you borrowed 10,000, you'll pay back 12,000. And on this, the payments are taken on a daily basis as a percentage of your takings. Um, this can be really useful because when sales aren't as good, by default, the amount you repay each day is less. When sales are good, the amount that you pay each day is more because it's a percentage of those takings. Um, next one along, tax funding. This is the ability to uh, fund your, your upcoming tax, whether that be corporation tax, VAT, or even twice a year, your self-assessment. I think at this point, I'll quickly add in, as I have done on, on previous events, is that there are three options when it comes to a tax liability. You can always pay the revenue in full. That's clearly the most sensible, but it isn't always the most beneficial to the business. Um, you can arrange with the revenue something that's called a time to pay arrangement. Uh, they don't always give them. If you've got an overdrawn director's loan account, they won't necessarily give it you. And if you've had arrears with the revenue in the past, they won't. Sometimes if you get the wrong person on the wrong day, it's also not available. Um, if you get a time to pay, that can, doesn't always, but can then affect future borrowings. Um, if you're going to look for or know that there's some um, funding you need down the line, having a time to pay arrangement in place will turn off some lenders. Um, and, and that's worth bearing in mind. Finally, third option is fund it. And if you do fund it, then it's over the term of the, the tax liability. So VAT is only over three months. Corporation tax and self-assessment is over 12 and the, the benefit to this over uh, a, a straightforward business loan is that if the amount that's due is less than 150 grand, there are lenders out there that will do this without the need for a director's guarantee. And that can be a, a real peace of mind thing for business owners. And then finally, property finance. Now this in itself, each of the things that I mentioned in here, um, you could cover for half an hour sessions individually. Um, but there's the short term bridging and uh, short term finance and bridging. There's development finance if you're building from scratch, commercial mortgages for commercial properties, um, buy to lets, um, HMOs. And, and on this, again, the, the range of uh, charges and fees um, is, is so in depth that it would need a, a specific conversation or a specific presentation to understand it. But you've got to be aware that there are fees in. At the front end, there are sometimes fees out at, at the back end when you're exiting with the finance. You can choose to pay it as interest only as long as there's an exit plan. You can 
you can pay it as an amortizing loan uh, and you've got to be careful about the, the loan to value ratios. They can range from 50% up to 70% and sometimes more. The, the finance world is a very moving beast. Uh, and so what I tell you today could easily change tomorrow or equally could change if the Bank of England do something with, with interest rates in the coming weeks. So that's the type of funding that's available. Um, it should cover almost any need that any business has. Um, and, and again, if there are any questions, a good accountant or a good finance broker should be able to steer you down the right route or indeed give you options to what you think originally is the right route. So what's the what does the current finance climate look like? Um, I thought I'd try and cover a, a few different things here. First and foremost, uh, the type of lenders that are out there. Everybody thinks of the bank as a lender. Um, surprisingly, they going into a bank and getting the loan only accounts for 5% of all finance written. 65%, two thirds of it is done by specialist lenders. Now they may well be the invoice financers, the asset financers, the tax funders, but that, that traditional route to goal of, of bank lending is a lot lower than it's perceived. 18% is done by challenger banks. Um, there are plenty of them around. You will, have, you will have come across them and heard of them. You may well even have a, have a bank account with them. 9% um, of lending is, is done still by peer-to-peer -peer lenders. Um, and then there's a range of, of other lenders, um, family and friends sometimes get involved, high net worth individuals and such like. So where's the money going? Um, businesses are applying for finance. Where is that money being deployed? Well, unsurprisingly, um, the greatest chunk of, of all money deployed is down in the southeast, 22% within the southeast and a, a further 14% within uh, Greater London. But what is pleasing to hear, especially with levelling up being a, uh, an agenda topic and uh, us being based in the northwest, is that 12% of all the funding, so the next highest amount, comes to the northwest of England. Yorkshire and the South West get around about 10% of it, and then the other regions, um, Wales and Scotland as well, Northern Ireland, get a smaller percentages. But it's a positive sign for Northwest businesses that actually, you know, we're an attractive proposition to lenders and money is being deployed here. Um, why do businesses, why do businesses take funding? A recent survey by the NACFB showed that 80% of funding is to either acquire property or assets. Um, that's a, a, a big chunk. Uh, I suppose it goes to show that um, bricks and mortar are still a sound investment. Um, and I suppose with, as Andrew mentioned before, the last two years of the super deduction, it's made absolute sense to invest in, in assets, new assets. And that may well show why this, this number is so high. 11% of funding uh, was used for uh, maintaining daily operations uh, to me and you cash flow or working capital although they're not terms that lenders like to hear um, five percent of it was used for product or service innovation which is good to see uh, and if there's any r d specialists they'll be over the moon to hear about that um, three percent to improve operational efficiencies um, maybe as a result of, of covid and not necessarily being in the office all the time and unfortunately, 1% of funding is there to save jobs or prevent insolvency. Um, that gives you an idea of, of why people are looking to raise money, though. And, and what's an average loan size? Well, I've, I've got this written down. So for asset finance, obviously, it can go anywhere from, from a few thousand pounds up to hundreds of thousands of pounds. But the average asset finance loan is £81,000. The average business finance is £130,000. The average invoice finance facility is just shy of half a million pound. And then on the property finance side of things, we've got buy to let at just under half a million, all the way up to development finance at one and a half million as an average size. Again, that range can go from a few thousand easily into a few million. Um, but hopefully those figures give you an idea if you're looking at buying something as to whether you're above average and will need to put more effort into an application or slightly lower and, and more likely to achieve that funding. Um, appetite. Um, this was this was trying to understand why a, 
um, a lender declined an application. Um, it's important to us as a broker if we put a, an application in, but equally, if you go direct, if you don't use a broker and you make an application, then it's important to understand why that's been declined. And it's true to say that the response outbound isn't always as thorough as, as you would like it to be. Um, again, having done some research into this though, 21% of applications are declined because it's outside of that lender's appetite. And that's just down to knowing what the lender likes, what they're, what they're looking for, as opposed to knowing that that business or that institution can, can lend money, but actually um, doesn't do what you want it to do. 12.5% is down to poor credit history. Um, this is this ties in with the next one, which is 10.5% is lack of strong cash flow. All too often we speak to clients who um, don't perceive the need to get finance now because they're in a good position. But as well, as over the years, the world has shown us, but certainly the last few years has shown us, we don't quite know what's around the corner. Um, and so it's almost while you're in a strong position, maybe get that finance. Just because you're applying for it today, if you're looking to get it over a long period, a three, four, five year period, then actually it might be that it's needed in six months time. But if something changes, the credit history of the company goes down or there's a, a, a weakening in your cash flow position, lenders will see this, they'll look at it as a downward trend and it'll be more difficult or it, it will be declined as a, a reason for not providing that funding. 7% um, of funding was declined because there was a reduced sector appetite Hospitality and retail have seen this massively over the last few years. Uh, and then smaller percentages include not enough collateral and indeed poor applications, um, something that, that really shouldn't be happening, but clearly still is. Um, let's have a quick look at what the future looks like. This is in a nutshell. Um, anticipated areas, if you're in one of these, um, and you may well hopefully be feeling good about things, but property, is an anticipated area of growth for lenders to be putting money out in construction, which is pleasing to hear manufacturing equally. So, especially in the UK to get our manufacturing back up on its feet is great. And there's an expectation that that will happen. Transportation um, and professions and scientific areas, as well as, although only a single digit um, percentage, the accommodation, food and, and hospitality sectors, there's an anticipation that there will be applications for funding in from those. Equally, what might be a threat to it? And this, this comes down to, to three things, really. These are fairly obvious, but worth putting in. Rising interest rates um, will always put people off and, and, and lenders off. Um, the, the lender's risk appetite, again, we don't know what's around the corner. Things change daily. Interest rates change daily. Risk appetites change daily as well. So understanding if that, that, that lender has got a, a feel for what you're asking it for is important. And also lack of borrowing appetite. And this hasn't really come up before, but it's either that businesses are not wanting to tie themselves in too much because the end is nigh, that's an unfortunate situation, or that they've been proactive and they've actually, they've, they've got enough in the bank already, possibly backed by the bank, uh, the British business banks, bounce back loan and Sybils. But there's a lack of borrowing appetite out there. I think we'll see this change over the coming months. But time will tell and the age of this webinar will be testament to that. So information needed. Um, what makes a good application? Um, this is hopefully a list of everything that you'll need to get a successful application and turn that into um, the finance that you require. The last full financial accounts are a must. And I put the word full in there because the abbreviated or, or um, bridged accounts that are on company's house aren't sufficient. If you put an application for financing, get the last full accounts off your accountant if they've not already given them to you. They're the ones with the notes and the detailed P&L. You'll also need to provide three months bank statements. Now, previously these would have been scanned. Now we can download them as a PDF. And actually now there's even open banking that you can click a link and allow that funder to access your bank accounts on a read-only basis um, to save you even having to download them. But providing bank statements is important. And at this point, having 
a well-managed account is also key. Um, not being up against your overdraft limit all the time is important. Making sure that payments aren't being bounced is important. And uh, if the, 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 there is a trend downwards that there's more money going out than there's coming in, then maybe an application for funding earlier on would be a sensible thing. Anyway, three months bank statements. Um, business and directors details, when it was established, how long the directors had been in situ, last three years worth of addresses, standard application stuff. Importantly um, for business owners, enabled much more so by bookkeeping technology, um, management information, the P&L and the balance sheet, certainly since the last set of accounts, um, the last set of accounts may well be nine or 12 months old. Um, so they're, they're out of date as, as much as they're there. Um, but funders are looking for more and more up-to-date MI. Um, this can be collated and provided by your accountant or can be downloaded if you've got one of the many bookkeeping software um, in, in place. And also your HMRC position. Uh, in December 20, the revenue went back to a preferred creditor um, above all the unsecured lenders. And so uh, your position with the revenue after that, as well as post COVID, when there were lots of um, deferrals of payments and time to pay arrangements put in place, lenders will want to know where you are with your VAT, with your core tax, with your PAYE, and if any of that is in time to pay arrangements. Um, more specifically, they're the broad information you'll need, that you'll need, but more specifically, uh, if you're looking to purchase an asset, then you'll need the asset details and the supplier details. Proof of title is key. Um, if you're looking for invoice finance, then your creditors and debtors will need to be provided. They'll want to see the quality of your debtors, the concentration levels, what terms you've got them on and such like. And if you're uh, looking at property, then there's there's many things. You, if you've got a portfolio, great. But there'll be other bits that aren't down on here. Uh, an asset and liability statement for the directors details of their experience, um, the existing portfolio, any rental income details, valuations of properties and such like. Uh, again, it should be information that is easy to hand, but is key to being provided before you submit an application. Go in being prepared, looking prepared, and you're already on the front foot with the lender. Um, so how does the process work? This is from a brokerage point of view, although I'd imagine it's very similar um, if you're applying directly. We'll do an application, so we'll collect all that information just mentioned. Uh, getting all that together really is down to the speed of the individual business owner. Once that's in, we'll do a bit of in-house analysis. We'll look through the accounts, ask any questions that may come up that are obvious, look through bank statements, um, and then we'll try and establish which lenders are the correct lenders. If they've got the appetite within the sector and for the for the, the funding required and then find out what rates and terms and conditions might be in place and at this point in time we provide an indicative quote and submit the proposal into the funder from there once it's in it goes into um, pre underwriting and underwriting and it should be in here anywhere from 24 to 72 hours that's a, a running clock once it goes in, if it gets to underwriting and they come back with queries, you can stop the clock because it'll then need to be the query will need to be answered and submitted back to underwriting for them to carry on. So a quick response will mean you'll get a quicker response. If you take your time in responding by default, the time it takes to get an answer will be extended. And once you've you've gone through underwriting, there'll be a decision. Yes, you'll get your funding, uh, or no and you'll try and get the reasons. As I say, um, there are different styles of underwriting. Some is algorithm based, some is human based, some is a mixture of the two. Some lenders will give you chapter and verse as to why they're not giving you the funding. Others will simply come back with a no, uh, an auto decline as it's known. Um, it would be important to any broker and, and should be to any business owner to understand why an application has been declined. And if it's something that can be rectified by the business, before you go trying to get a second or a third or a fourth application with a different lender in place. Um, and then once that's 
once that decision's there, if if the funding's been agreed, documents raised, funds released, is a quick turnaround. 24 hours front to back, um, same day payments. Again, traditionally delayed by signing of paperwork by directors of the business. Uh, let's have a look. Why use a broker? We're coming to the end. Andrew, I hope we're doing okay for time as I have no visibility of anybody on the uh, on the screen. But why use a broker? Well, you know, our knowledge, we know the funders, we know the rates, we know what appetite are there, and we know what's required. We've got the experience. We're NACFB, or every good broker should be NACFB regulated uh, and FCA regulated, and they'll have relationships with funders. That experience, that wealth of knowledge, that is absolutely something that any business can benefit from. Linking back to the lack of access to a bank manager the broker can step in and fill that. Uh, peace of mind, from, from your side of things, you're often referred to us by a trusted advisor, um, an accountant or a networking colleague. I mentioned the FCA regulation. And, and ultimately, a broker gets paid a commission. If that broker um, wants to be paid, he has to be successful in getting funding raised. And as a result, it comes down to two things, service and price. And, and that should give you the peace of mind that you'll get the best service and that indeed you'll get the best price. Because if you could go elsewhere, you will do, and that broker won't earn a living. Time savings is important. Yes, the internet is there. I've tried to book a holiday. I've tried to organize insurance through aggregator sites. Yeah, it's a quick way to do it, but it isn't. It is hours of analysis and review and reading to be done. Um, let us do that heavy lifting. Let a broker do that. You carry on running the business, provide the information when it's requested, and let us do all of that filtering around and running through. And then finally, the access to funders. Not every funder or lender is available directly. Some indeed are only broker-led lenders. Um, of those who do offer a direct arm, 70% of their business is done via a broker shows the importance of a broker to the financial setup and to the lenders and, and the main reason that they they look at the broker route is because we know how to present the application in um there's a reduced marketing cost they don't have to market to you directly they market to us we know who they are and if you use a broker we know what they do um, and there's also the ability to access volume driven discounts um it's it's as simple as that hopefully without having taken too long without having a clue what the time looks like i'm finished so it's over back to andrew and i suppose to open up the floor to say any questions well, that's been brilliant steve really informative i think there's some really good information there for people looking at lending um totally get your points to the end about using a broker yes people can can go online and google and do themselves but obviously you guys have got the depth of knowledge um, to know what suits a particular business needs. And I think that's the important aspect of it. Um, of course, yes, let's um, go back to here. There we go. Super. So magic, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I noticed, I didn't mention at the start, but as usual, we have the comments box and the chat box. Um, the top right if anyone's got any questions please do use that chat box you'll find uh, the little speech bubbles top right hand corner of your uh, screen uh, there is one question here from harvey thank you harvey is that peppercorn rent a standard approach for most all finance leases ends that was right near the start when you were talking about the different types of lending yeah, I, as I say, I had the full screen. Harvey, thanks for that question. Um, you, you're right. Uh, yeah, there are, with, with a finance lease, there's no intention to own it. It's not a higher purchase, so it's a finance lease. So at the back end, you will either have the option to sell that on behalf of the um, the, the lender and take the, the majority of the proceeds or go into a peppercorn rental. And to just recap what I'd said, um, yeah, if you're paying... Uh, 200 pound a month over a three or five year term and, and it comes to the end of it the lender has then had all of their their money back they've made their profit the, the asset is paid off and so if you want to approaching them and saying look i'd like to extend the, the lease they'll do it on that basis they'll do it on what is across 
all of the lenders that, that, that uh, uh, Amiga Finance deal with is an annual payment equivalent to the old monthly payment. So it would be just £200 a year. hope that clears that one up. No, oh, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Thanks for that. Um, okay. Well, thank you for thank you for that, Steve. It's been absolutely brilliant. Um, again, thank you for those joining us live on the webinar. Hope you found that really informative. Sorry, Andrew, Steve. we've just seen one more has just come up into the oh, system. Yeah. Stuart's just Great. asked indicative indicative range of broker fees. Um, okay. it, it it could be a, a set fee. It might just be a, I don't know, a few hundred pound, five hundred pound couple of thousand pound whatever the brokerage the size of the brokerage um that there might be a set fee uh, or there might be a percentage and, and some lenders will tell you what percentage you're earning as a broker other other lenders will give the broker the ability to put a commission in up to a certain amount um they won't let brokers go up to 20 and 30 percent um a because it's it's not the broker's risk it's their risk b because it it changes the the apr on on a lot of things although there is no apr on um on limited company lending it, it affects things so to give you an indicative range maybe a, a few hundred pounds as a fee and as a percentage i think anywhere between one and ten percent it's fairly broad that it, it doesn't really answer it but feel free to ask the broker that you're dealing with exactly what their fees are they shouldn't have anything to hide great thank you um we'll carry on chatting just for a few minutes just to see if anyone else has got any questions on there uh one question i was thinking of is obviously how how long does it normally take from sort of initial application through to receiving funding how easy well, is that it, it, yeah things go quickly though it's easy and and and, and um it, it it kind of was in there there wasn't a full time scale on the, the presentation but if an application is put in um and it and it goes through smoothly there's no queues at the the lenders end and it goes through smoothly you could make an application on a monday and it could be could be funded by the end of the week um wow. it, it, it really can be as quickly as that if the directors on board available to sign documents provide information um equally so and as we get towards month ends there tends to be a a, a block up of um application queues but a, a, a long time might be um, a couple of weeks because it might sit in an underwriting queue for a couple of days then it might be a couple of days or more in underwriting there might be a couple of queries from the underwriter which need answering then the docs need to be raised and then there might be a queue in payouts so those things could stretch it out to maybe a couple of weeks fairly broad range again but Hopefully, it gives you the answer you're after. Yeah, no, so you sometimes think it's going to take quite a long time, but that sounds like if you get get all your ducks in a row, it doesn't take long at all. So, no, that's really good. Um, can't see any more questions. Obviously, there's probably plenty of questions from people um, on the YouTube. We're catching this up on YouTube. Obviously, can't ask the question live. If you do have questions, I'm sure Steve's uh, contact details will be in the comments on the YouTube. Um, if not, please do just get in touch with Hearts and we can easily put you through to Steve. Um, I know he's helped quite a number of our clients uh, over the recent years and the feedback's been fantastic, Steve, for, for the work you've done. So thank you ever so much for, for what you do. Thanks, Andrew. Excellent. I wish you all a good day and we look forward to seeing you at future seminars. You take care. Thank you.